This video is sponsored by ButcherBox. A couple weeks ago, I finished up the elevator table build. It was multiple months in the making and we use it all the time. It's fantastic. The only problem is we don't have enough seats for it. So that's the problem I'm solving this week. I've come up with a couple different designs in my sketchbook and the ones I settled on were these triangle shaped nesting stools. I think they're gonna look really good and they're gonna store away really easily. Also, Ashley and I have been talking about for a long time, trying our hands at woven tops for seats. I'm really excited to try this out. I, I've, I've watched a bunch of videos, but I haven't actually done it yet. This is gonna be a super fun build. I'm really excited about it. I think most of it can be made out of scrap wood. I already have in the shop, so let's just get into it. Recently I've started using miniatures as a way to model out my furniture. It's it's nothing new from a furniture building uh, perspective, but in my shop I've, I've started doing it a lot more and I find that it's it's helping a ton. It allows me to quickly mock up a design and make sure that the proportions are right, make sure that the leg angles are correct, and kind of think a little bit about the joinery but not worry too much about it. It's also really nice that you don't have to use expensive materials. I mean, I'm literally using popsicle sticks and hot glue here. It takes the intimidation factor down a whole bunch of notches so that you feel comfortable just making stuff really quick, and if something doesn't look right, it's really easy to change. After making three of these little models and nesting them together, I was really happy with them. I thought the proportions looked right, the leg angle was good, so I was ready to move on to the next step. And the next step is to test out my concept for the joinery of these legs. And I, I, I had a little bit of an idea, uh, and it turned out to work pretty darn well. So I know from my pattern plywood work that you make a hexagon using 60 degree angles, and a triangle is made up of 60 degree angles. An equilateral triangle is three 60 degree angles. So I figured I could use those sides of the hexagon as my basis for my joinery, and I could also bring this really close to being round so that when I go to turn it at the very end, uh, it's not too much trouble. I double checked to make sure that the hexagon was equilateral and then I could move on to building the jig to make the joinery. I'm gonna be using a domino joiner to make most of the joints in this stool. And in order to do that, I need a, to set up a jig so that I can cut into the flat side of the hexagon and I was hoping that I could just use my table saw set up the way that it was, but unfortunately I, I needed a steeper angle. I actually needed the opposite angle, which is 120 degrees. Fortunately, I found a pretty simple fix. All I really had to do was double stick tape these to a couple of two by fours and then run them back through the table saw. Now that I had the angle right, I could trim them to fit so that that angled section is the same length as one of the sides of the hexagon. From my model, I discovered that I liked a 10 degree angle on the legs. And so I need to set this jig that I'm building for the, the domino at 10 degrees as well, so that the joinery comes in at the correct angle. I cut these blocks on the chop saw and they just butt right up against the hexagon. And this is gonna allow the plate of the domino joiner to come in at the correct angle. 
The final element to the jig is this little cleat that goes on the back, and it just prevents the hex gun from moving around when it's inside the jig. So now you can see that how this whole contraption works. I just slide the domino jointer into place. I've got it set on the widest setting with an eight millimeter bit inside, and I cut one face, rotate it, and then cut the next face. I was a little concerned that the domino wouldn't have enough depth to get to the center of the leg so that these mortises lined up, but fortunately there was just enough in the tool to get all the way in there, so I lucked out on that one. I also off camera made a couple of tester stretcher pieces. I'll show you how I made these in a little bit, but I'm using them to, to make sure that this joinery will work, figure out how they're kind of going to interconnect. I had the idea of making it sort of like a box joint on the inside so they overlap each other and should give the joint a lot of strength as long as it's a nice tight fit. So I took my time, I spent a lot of time on the bandsaw trying to puzzle this out and eventually I managed to get there. It was at this point that I realized that I made a big mistake and only made one of these hexagons because I need three in order to actually test out the joinery. So I just cut the one that I had into three separate parts and then added the joints to those parts. And that way I could put them all together and see if this thing actually works. <laughs> uh, it works, it works. With the proof of concept, I could then go forward with, with milling up walnut, and my aim is to only use scrap wood for this. I honestly didn't know how many stools I'd be able to make with the scrap wood that I had. Turns out I had enough to make 13 legs, which is enough for four stools and one leg extra, just in case I mess something up. With all the leg blanks milled, I could go back over to the jig and start mortising out all the dominoes. always one. Before cutting all of the stretchers and turning the legs, I wanted to make 100% sure that everything was going to work properly. So I quickly cut out a couple of stretchers that were roughly the right size, not necessarily perfect, but enough to get the job done, and then banged them together to see if they would fit up. All the parts fit up fine, but the ultimate test is to try and sit in it. Without any glue in the joints, I wasn't about to rock back and forth, but it, it was sturdier than expected. So I'm going to be turning these, not on a lathe, because I don't have one, but I'm going to be turning it on the table saw. I did this in another video, I built a whole jig for it, and uh, I haven't had a chance to use it 
for a while. So I'm excited about this. I start by drilling a hole in the top of the leg for a quarter inch T-nut, and I left these legs a little bit tall so I can cut this hole away at the very end. I also drill a hole at the bottom of each leg with an eighth inch drill bit. This will hold the tailstock, which is basically a framing nail. If you would like to build one of these jigs yourself, I have plans available on my website at almfab.com plans, as well as, like I said, a full video showing you how to make it. Attaching the leg to the jig is really simple. You just screw it into place and lock it with a lock nut and then slot it into the tailstock, which is again, a framing nail at the very end, and then lock off the T-track. The sled has a runner that runs along the track in the table saw, and then you attach a drill to spin up the leg. After the leg is run through the table saw, you can sand it right on the sled and it gets a really nice finish. After that's done, I can remove the leg from the jig and swap in another one. This goes really fast. Uh, this is this is regular speed. It's not sped up at all. So it's, it's super quick to batch out a bunch of these legs and they're incredibly consistent. Every single leg is exactly the same. This week's video is sponsored by ButcherBox. Click the link in my description to get ground beef for life. That's right, new ButcherBox members will receive two pounds of grass-fed ground beef for the lifetime of their membership, plus free shipping. ButcherBox delivers high quality meats at an unbeatable value directly to your door. You can choose from four curated boxes or create your own custom box and select the delivery schedule that meets your needs. Your box shows up at your doorstep in eco-friendly, recyclable packaging. The meat is delivered frozen at the peak of freshness, so you can cook your meals whenever you like. If you're like us and you love to grill, it is a great way to stock up on grillables. Ashley and I got the 100% grass-fed beef box, and last night we grilled up a pair of sirloins, and they were fantastic. ButcherBox offers free-range USDA certified chicken, wild-caught seafood, 100% grass-fed pasture-raised beef, as well as bacon sourced from humanely raised pork that is uncured, nitrate-free, and sugar-free. Again, if you'd like to sign up for ButcherBox, click the link in my description to get ground beef for life. New ButcherBox members will receive two pounds of grass-fed ground beef for the lifetime of their membership, plus free shipping. Thanks, ButcherBox. Now back to the bill. It seems like years ago that my buddy Nathan dropped off this walnut scrap and I've been looking for something to use with it. It's a little bit shy of half inch and only 18 inches long. So it's not been very useful up until now and now it's the perfect material for this. There's more than enough here to make plenty of slats for all of the stools and even the off cuts from this, I'm gonna be able to use in the stools as well. Thanks Nathan. To finish off the profile, it is as simple as putting an eighth inch roundover bit into the router table and running it through with a feather board. Side note, if you own a Festool Domino, this is a great way to batch out a bunch of dominoes and use up your scrap wood at the same time. Every one of these slats needs a 10 degree bevel cut on, on each end. Uh, the first end, it doesn't matter the measurement, but the second end, it's going to. So when I made those test pieces, I figured out how wide each of them need to be. There's two widths, there's the lower slat and the upper slat, and I'm cutting out the upper slats here. Again, one of these days I'm gonna build a stop block for this, but I'm still just screwing in a stop block whenever I need it. Once all the slats were beveled, I went and drew out with a template 
all of the cuts that I needed to make. This may seem a little excessive, but it's really easy to confuse which side you're cutting on these, and this just made it pretty much foolproof. I'm not using this line to cut off of, I'm just kind of using it as a marker. To actually set up the cut, I used a fence on the bandsaw. Now was the moment of truth, putting all these parts together. It was a lot of parts, so I was worried that if one of them was wrong, then they'd all be wrong. But fortunately, it went fairly smoothly. The, the one trouble that I had was I kept uh, confusing which side was up or which angle faced which way, but uh, I managed to get through it. With the stools assembled, I went back over to the table saw and used my Rockler Precision Miter Gauge to trim up those excess pieces left over from when I made the slats. I'm going to be using these to reinforce the upper slat on the stool. I felt like the upper slat was a little on the thin side. This is also going to help with the parachute cord so it's not going over such a, a sharp turn. Uh, I was worried that with the parachute cord wrap that they would maybe start to bend under tension or they might have kind of too much twist on them when somebody was sitting on them. So this, this seemed like a good, easy way to reinforce them. I just glued them up and held them into place with a couple Rockler bandy clamps. As I mentioned earlier, I left the tops of the legs long so that I could trim them later. And I came up with this idea to use a hole saw and just cut a hole into a board that I could lay on top of the stools, clamp into place, and then run along the outside of it with a pole saw, cutting it perfectly flush to the surface. This is gonna make sure that it's, it's level to the surface of the seat and it's gonna sit just slightly proud, not so much that it's gonna be uncomfortable, but high enough so that when we wrap the parachute cord around, it's really easy to register against. This also helps it lock into place when it's nesting with other stools. On the opposite end of the stool, I also want to level out the feet. They are at that 10 degree angle and I'd like them to sit flush. So the way that I like to do this is I just tape down a couple of handy shims to the surface of the table and then I run my Japanese pole saw along them, making it flush. One thing that you do have to do after this is tape a handy shim to the bottom of it that's the same size and then you can rotate and cut the next leg. If you don't do this, you're gonna be kind of chasing this angle over and over again. It's not gonna ever end up sitting flush. I eased over all those freshly trimmed edges to make sure that they don't catch on anything or splinter out. And then I sanded up the rest of the stools and got them ready for finish. 
I'll be using the same finish that I used on the elevator table. This is Rubio Monocoat Pure. It is a hard wax oil finish. And if you use the catalyzer, it dries in 24 hours, which is super convenient because we wanted to start weaving these stools the very next day. I went on a little bit of a paracord buying spree. There are so many color options out there. I'll post links to the ones that I found down below. Ashley chose the yellow paracord and I went with the pink. We made these little spools really quick on the bandsaw and then we were ready to give it a go. So I have absolutely no weaving experience and Ashley has done a fair bit of crochet work, but this is pretty different. We relied heavily on this video by Ed Hammond that is on triangle rush seat weaving. I'll post a link to this video because it was hugely helpful in this in this project. I probably watched it about a dozen times just to get the, the technique down. There's really not a lot of reference for weaving triangular seats. That's probably not much of a surprise. I haven't seen many triangular seats, but fortunately this video is, exists because I designed the stools well before I found his video. And this is really the only one that I could find on the subject. There are a couple tips and tricks that Ed goes into when weaving a triangle. Uh, the main one is that you need to leave slack as you go. You can't just pull it tight, otherwise you won't have enough slack when you come around the bend to cinch everything in. So you kind of measure things out with your fingers. This is my first go at it, so I'm kind of doing a bad job, but I'll show you a, a, me doing a better job later on when I work on my second stool. I, I struggled with this early on, uh, but Ashley, Ashley seemed to take to it really well. She started by taking her time and really paid attention to the video. And I think uh, probably some of her crochet skills came into effect, but she got really nice tight corners. And I ended up uh, having to reference off of what she had done as I moved forward. So Ashley's looks way better than mine. Uh, she worked on hers last night. Uh, I wasn't filming it, but I, I, I came upstairs and I saw it and it looks so much better. A lot more tension on the on the strings on the inside. This one, the parachute cord is a little bit loose. So I'm actually undoing most of it so that I can get it so that it looks, so that it matches and I think it's gonna hold up a lot better. I'll admit it was a little painful undoing it. Uh, I, I debated about it for a while, but really I didn't have enough tension in it. And the only way was to go back almost all the way to the beginning and, and rewrap it. It was well worth it. And also like I had already put about two hours into it, um, but I got way faster really quickly, especially once Ashley kind of told me her secret. The key is to slide your fingers across uh, to hold the tension while you kind of crank down on it on one side. The difference between the paracord and the rush is that the paracord is slippery. So we kind of have to pull it a little bit tighter. There's also some spring which means that if you add a little more tension, it's kind of it's kind of better. So it just took a little while to get the feel for it. We also have a little clamp that we're locking on the the edge of the of the previous weave that we just did. So that helps to keep that tension as you move forward. It's inevitable when you do this that you're going to run out of cord and it's really easy just to tie in a square knot in the middle of it. You want to kind of center this in the middle of one of those sides. And then as you continue your weave, it just basically gets covered up. The paracord comes in 200 foot rolls and I think you need about 250 feet to do one of these stools. So I ended up running out of the pink cord and had to order more. So uh, I ended up moving on to my second stool and just locking it off for the time being. 
For my second stool, I decided to go with black and white paracord, and I just thought this would be a nice kind of sophisticated look. We had a bunch of bright colors already going, and uh, I thought it'd be fun to do a, a black and white one. So you can change colors as you go. You just have to kind of count as you go to make sure you have the, the right number of rows on each corner, and then just tie in again with that square knot a different color and, and move around the stool. Ashley started describing these as figure eights, the wraps around the corners, and I think that's the best way to think about it. You're basically wrapping a figure eight around each corner, tensioning it, and then moving it to the next corner. We both got really fast at these by the end. Our first stools took close to four hours to do, and our second stools were half that time. It was two hours, maybe two and a half hours to get it all done. And the process became so subconscious that it was really meditative and fun you don't really think about it too much you can watch tv in the background in fact ashley finished her stool upstairs watching tv and uh it was it, I, i'm a little sad i didn't get more footage of it because it is my favorite stool stool but uh but it it was a nice thing to do we we both said at the end of it we wish i had made more stools so that we could do more of these wraps so there might be more of these in our future as you get closer and closer to the center of it, it's harder to hide nuts, and it's also a lot tighter in the center. But the cool thing about it is it starts to tighten up all of the, the wraps that you've done previously. Uh, you're basically pushing them out towards the edges and packing in this paracord. Towards the end of it, I had to use a scratch all just to get the paracord up and through because it was so tight. In Ed's video, he tied one single overhand knot to hold the rush in place, but I found that the paracord is just too slippery for that. So I did three overhand knots on each sort of set of, of strings and then tucked it underneath the paracord, and that seemed to hold pretty well. So happy. <laughs> these, these came out way better than expected. The hexagonal tops were unexpected and um, the weave, I mean, look at this. This one's definitely the best, I, I think. Um, this is the one that Ashley did at the very end. Most of it was done off camera, unfortunately. Uh, same process as these, just switching out the, the different parachute cords. And this is actually an accident, the two-tone the two here. Uh, this is from the same manufacturer, just the probably different batches, so they're different colors. We're looking to do more woven stuff, so if you got ideas, leave them in the comments down below. I've really been enjoying the comments lately. I read all the comments and I'm super appreciative. I can't re respond to everyone, but I'm super appreciative that you guys leave comments and leave me ideas for future videos. Big thank you to my sponsor of this week's video, ButcherBox, and a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys support me every single month. Really appreciate it. You guys are the best, and I'll catch you in the next one.